Thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome to our uh, spring quarter town hall. I'm glad you all found time in your schedule on this busy Monday, the last day of April to come. Um, this is going to be a regular town hall, but I want to tell you we are in the process of uh, thinking outside the box with our town hall, and I'll tell you a little bit of that, about that in a minute. But uh, somebody asked me about this cover picture, uh, and the cover picture does have meaning. Uh, if you know this is kind of the year or the couple years that we're celebrating and focusing on our youth and children in the city of Tacoma, how many knew that? A couple of you did. It's been a focus. But you know, when I first got here, Tanya and Andrews, who uh, now is Tanya Duran, she is the CEO of the Children's Museum and the Muse Day Care Center, she asked me why we didn't have little chairs in front of our bookstore. Uh, and I worked on that and worked on that and worked for, on that and I could not get little chairs at the bookstore. But lo and behold, we got a new bookstore manager. Has anybody met uh, Lonnie? I think her name is Lonnie. Anybody met Lonnie yet, the bookstore manager? I asked Lonnie about it and lo and behold, like two days later, little purple chairs appeared there. So this is great news. It's celebrating youth and kids in our community. So that does have purpose. So. In the spirit of continuous improvement, uh, the last couple town halls, uh, I've been doing my job, I've been talking to you, but I haven't been doing the part of the job where it gets you to ask questions. So uh, I'm thinking maybe I'm doing something wrong. So I want you to answer this little survey. What do you like about the way town hall works? What do you not like about the way town hall works? And if you don't want to ask questions in here, I do have a new blog that we started as part, part of the cultural initiative this year. So maybe I can answer some of your questions or concerns on the blog. But anyway, we're open to thinking about town halls. So fill this out. And how are we going to collect these? We'll pick them up. Just leave them in your seat, and we'll pick them all up afterwards. OK? All right. What are we going to do today? Well, we're going to do mostly the same thing. I have added a little feature at the end, since you weren't asking questions. I'm going to highlight a couple areas around campus. I will try to go through the beginning part of it a little quicker if I can, but then I'll tell you about what I know in a couple other areas of campus, uh, and specifically in our research enterprise and in uh, the um, student and enrollment services. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through some of the updates since the last town hall, which was February 6th. And you know I like to talk about sports a little bit, so I'll probably do that a little bit. A little bit about organizational changes, talk about the campaign update, where we are. Uh, I think there's some, some important information about the previous legislative session that didn't close until after the last town hall, uh, and then our campus preparations for the next legislative session. I want to talk just briefly about our financial picture, our new and improved financial picture, where we're very proud of. A little bit about campus growth that's based on that financial picture. Uh, update you on charting our course, the strategic plan, and then of course the two highlight areas, and then it opened up for questions and concerns you might have. So you ready? Okay. Now uh, I need to make a disclaimer because when I do highlight things, that means I leave out automatically some things. So if I didn't highlight your, your thing, I'm sorry. I try to think through uh, what's been going on in my office and highlight some of those. Everything we do on campus is important. Uh, and if you want me to highlight your thing, let me know, and I'll point it out next time. So just since February 6th, uh, let me start with the sports. Our basketball team was a big surprise. Uh, we finished 21 and 13, and for a little short period of time, it looked like we might get into the NCAA tournament. We didn't. However, we got invited to the NIT, and we made it to the second game, and we would have gone farther, except we ran into St. Mary's, who was 30 and 5. So it was a good basketball season. Now, for the women's team, who was right in contention last year, it wasn't so good with respect to wins and losses, but look what happened to the, the team members. Five of our women's basketball team members were all Pac-12. And I learned last week at the President's Cabinet that 29, no, 30 of our 31 varsity sports at the UW are all above 3.0. That's pretty awesome to have a sports program that that's academically centered. Okay, now uh, also last week when I was preparing my slides, our women's softball team was what number in the country? Anybody know last week? We were number one in the country. 
But uh, also two and three are in the same conference we were, or we are, and we ran into them later in the week. So when I first made this slide, we were 41 and two. And then we ran into UCLA, who was number two at the time. Now they're number one. They beat us three out of three games, and uh, the University of Oregon beat us two out of two. So we're still in the top four, uh, and, and there's always the end of the season, so that's going well. Uh, we also have a freshman of the year player contention in, uh, in Seattle. Now, bringing Husky athletics more locally, uh, we did have Coach Hopkins on campus about two weeks ago. How many of you saw Coach? Joe, Ty were there. He's a great speaker, very inspirational. I really like what he brings uh, to Husky Athletics. Uh, and along with that, uh, Mentha, who's not here yet, but Mentha has been talking to both Coach Hopkins and to Jen Cohen, our athletic director, who's from Tacoma. And we're going to see some exciting ways that our students can be involved in Husky Athletics next fall, both by going there and by having them come here. So stay tuned for that. We'll learn more about that later. Okay, our people, a lot of things going on here, and I just have a few to, to highlight. Professor Marion Harris was named the Social Worker of the Year for the state of Washington this March. Yes. Roz, who I saw in the room, where are you, Roz? There she is. Roz is kind of famous. She is the student veterans advisor of the whole country of the year. Uh, so. We all know Professor Medeiros, but how many of you know that he was awarded the, by FutureWise as our community advocate? Where's that? I thought I saw him, maybe not. He's not in here? Let's clap for him anyway, <laughs> Professor Medeiros. And Dr. Quinn, Jenny Quinn, uh, was named to the officer at large position of the National Mathematical Association, so we're proud of that. Yes. And I already ran into something I know I missed, Professor Kim McCargill right down here in the next to the front row was just named Associate Dean or Assistant Dean of the Graduate School. Associate Dean of the Graduate School for UW. So a lot of exciting things happening with our faculty and staff, but also a lot of things happen, happening with our students. Youssef, Youssef Benor, a student I know very well. He's uh, been involved in uh, leadership positions. Uh, he just went on a, a trip to DC and met the Tunisian ambassador. That was pretty exciting for him, I know. He's excited about that. Uh, we're also going to talk about him a little bit later because he's one of the Husky 100 this year. Also, we've joined the campus, the Washington Campus Compact a year ago. And this year, two of our students, Christy Tinglehast and Eric Ballantyne, were both named uh, community service advocates at this conference that we had in March. So I was really proud of them. Uh, unfortunately, Christy couldn't be there, but Eric was there to get his picture made with myself and the advisor of the year. So we're proud of them. Uh, I have not met Becky yet, but I read the other day in the paper that she is on the board of trustees of South Puget Sound Community College. That's pretty impressive. Uh, one of our students has already uh, been elected to a board of trustees for a higher ed institution in the, in the United States, or here in the Washington. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then Melanie Randall, a 2017 graduate of our IT program, has gotten one of five positions uh, across the country as a foreign affairs fellow. So these are all our students continuing to do many great things. So let's hear it for our students. Now, not just our students, but our campus as a whole. Uh, Jill and I had the privilege of accepting on behalf of our campus the golden shovel, and it's actually a shovel. There's a picture of it there, and, a, and I took a, another picture of it so you could see it's a whole shovel and not just the plate. But uh, earlier this spring, it was about six weeks ago, we as a campus got named uh, as the Golden Shovel Awardee. They just do one of these years, the Economic Development Corporation of the greater Tacoma, Pierce County area. So this was a really big honor, and we accepted it on behalf of all of you. It's given to an institution who has a very high impact on the economic vitality of the region. So let's hear it for all of you. Okay, another really, I think, outstanding opportunity we had was uh, 
we have a long time, or did have a long time serving regent who was based right here in Tacoma, and that was Mr. Herb Simon. He was a regent for 11 years. He had three terms on the Board of Regents, and, and finally he was term limited and had to go off the board, so we had an event to celebrate him. And lo and behold, our own, my advisory board chair, Mr. David Zeke, was named the next regent, not necessarily for uh, Tacoma, but the next UW regent at the same time. So we had a, an event on our campus where we recognized Herb Simon for his 11 years of service and Dave Zeke for his many years of service as, on our advisory board and then as chair for seven years. So it was a great event. You can see the audience. Uh, in fact, Ann's right there in front row and there's Sharon. But there's a lot of other, I see Michael Wark over there, a lot of other people in the room too. It was a great evening, uh, and we all had a good time. We roasted them a little bit, but mostly we honored them. And uh, I brought into being, I guess, a new honor, and it was the Chancellor's Summit of Leadership Award, a new award that uh, I gave the first two to these two gentlemen, but it's an award that we will give to other people, both in our community and inside our institution, uh, as long as I'm chancellor, that really uh, is for outstanding, distinguished leading on our campus on the benefit of our students. While we were there, uh, we took notice of how much our Pierce County legislative contingent has been leading with respect to our campus as well. So we baked them a cake as if I had something to do with it. Somebody baked them a cake, and uh, Brianna had it ordered for us. But we made this cake that says, thank you for serving like the mountain is out. How many of you seen the guerrilla marketing campaign in Tacoma? All of you seen that? Like, so we took that and applied it to lead like the mountain is out. So I had a cake for them, and we had a good showing of legislators that came to this event. So while we were honoring Herb, and David, we honored our legislative contingents as well, and I think they were really happy about it. And we'll talk a little bit about what they did shortly. Okay, another thing that we've been up to is um, I like to do benchmarking. Uh, something I learned early in my academic career, I think it was 1994, I went to a seminar about benchmarking and have been doing it ever since. So this year, I, I, I feel like I drug our leadership team. Uh, some of them kicking and, and screaming uh, to a benchmarking trip and primarily we wanted to go to Georgia State University which I'm going to talk about in a minute because uh, I witnessed a, a great presentation by them last year and their last summer and they were doing many things that I think we aspire to do uh, and some things we're doing better than they are but they have a lot of good things so as we were planning that trip uh, I remembered how close we were to the University of Georgia, and you know that we are just launching an educational outreach unit on campus, and the University of Georgia has a long-standing, very prestigious uh, Georgia Center right in the middle of their campus, so I thought, well, while we're in Georgia, let's just buzz over there for a day and see that place. So you can see they rolled out the red carpet for us. As soon as we walked in the hotel, they had this cardboard, that's a bulldog. It's kind of, our dog is pretty easy to tell what it is. That's a bulldog, though. And if you can't see that little sign, they, uh, they had, look, our husky and their little bulldog there. So they really made us feel at home. It was an outstanding trip. Uh, and we, we met about that trip actually this morning. And we talked about how they really have uh, Southern hospitality there. They really go out of their way to make all of their uh, resources and services very hospitable. So another cool thing they have that we don't have is they have a Ugga suite. Ugga is their mascot, that's the dog, Ugga, and they literally have a suite in their hotel on campus for that dog. Uh, and before every football game, they bring him in a limousine. I guess it's a him, maybe it's a, probably a her. Uh, but they bring the, the mascot to the suite and he stays in that room overnight. It was pretty amazing. If we had a hotel, we're not going to have a hotel, but if we did, we wouldn't give a room to, to a dog, I don't think, but maybe we would. I don't know. But that's us in the Ugga suite. I think it was the nicest suite there. So what we really uh, wanted to concentrate on was Georgia State University. Georgia State University, most people hear about the University of Georgia. They hear about Georgia Tech but seldom do we hear about Georgia State. Well, Georgia State is an up and coming institution. They're doing a lot of great things. And how many of you saw 60 Minutes uh, last night? Mostly about what institution? Princeton. But there you saw uh, Bill Gates and his wife talking to other people. The president of Georgia State was there too. 
He was in the room. In fact, Bill Gates has been to Georgia State University to talk to the students about what's going on there. Uh, they're really moving and shaking. Uh, if you look at them, uh, they do many things similar to us. They're much bigger. First of all, they have 55,000 students there. That's because they just absorb Perimeter College, which is 15,000 students, but uh, not 55, 51,000 students. But they have 3,000 international students. They have seven different campuses throughout Georgia, mostly in the metro, greater downtown metro area. Uh, they have 250 different degree programs. And I'm not advocating that we have 250 different degree programs. Don't, don't get me wrong. We have plenty of degree programs. Uh, but they have more degree programs than any other institution in the state of Georgia. They have a $2.5 billion economic impact on their community. They have study abroad. Uh, their faculty are very well qualified, just like our faculty are. And they have a very diverse student population, more diverse even than our campus. And we believe our campus is uh, extremely diverse. It's one of the top 50 most diverse campuses in America. And they have scale. And we all know we have aspirations of continuing to, uh, to meet the needs of the South Sound. So as we scale up, I don't know if we'll ever be at 51,000, but as we continue to grow, this is a university we want to keep close watch on. And we learned a lot from them. And this morning, again, we spent a couple hours debriefing and talking about, so what? What are we going to do as a result of this visit? So it was a great visit. Uh, also, uh, just recently, uh, how many of you went to our bell ring? About half of you were there. Well, the, that was a great event. It was uh, organized by our Center for Equity and Inclusion. And the reason we organized that event is Dr. Honey, Michael Honey, uh, has just written a book. Well, he, he wrote it over a long time, but has just released a new book called To the Promised Land, which is kind of... Uh, a little bit of the backstory, some of the things most of us don't know about the work of Dr. Martin Luther King and his work on poverty and all those kinds of things. And it just so happened that this book is being released at the almost exact time as the 50th anniversary of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. So uh, because of his book release, Dr. Honey has been in pretty high demand going around the country talking about the book and talking about the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. And he was invited to be uh, one of the primary speakers at the Lorraine Hotel, where, or I actually think it was a motel, right? Motel. Uh, where this happened in Memphis, Tennessee on the actual celebration. Uh, and at that celebration, at the moment in which Dr. Uh, King was assassinated, which was 6.01 p.m. Uh, Memphis time, which was 4.01 our, our time, they were going to start ringing a bell uh, at least they were going to ring it once for each year of his life, and he only lived to be 39. So Dr. Uh, Honey asked if we would be willing to do a sister event on this campus, and a lot of other places around the country were. Uh, and we agreed to do that, and the Center for Equity and Inclusion jumped into action. Uh, we didn't have a bell, uh, but they got us one. A really nice bell, a local fire station loaned us their bell. Uh, they got several students involved, some community speakers involved, and we had our version of the bell ring ceremony uh, on our campus. And we waited about three minutes into the time that the bell ring, ring ceremonies were supposed to start to give it a chance to cascade across the country. Because people in Kansas and Colorado and Utah and whatever's in between uh, could get their bells ringing, and then we had our bell ring ceremony as well. It was a really nice event. Uh, one of the things that I did, I had a few minutes to talk at the end, and we had just been to the University of Georgia and Georgia State. Georgia State is right down in uh, the Sweet, Sweet Auburn district where Dr. King lived and where he uh, preached at Ebenezer Baptist Church. There's a giant monument for him there. His wife, I mean, he is buried there. Uh, and I saw this one particular concrete uh, stanchion that uh, had a wonderful saying that I thought had application for our campus. So uh, I use this in my closing comments for the bell ringing ceremony to try to make it real for our campus and the work we have in front of us. So another event uh, getting closer to today was just, I believe, maybe last Monday or maybe a week ago Monday, but it was a recent event. Uh, Milgard does its uh, leadership awards every year, uh, and this year, outstanding slate of candidates. It just amazes me year after year uh, what wonderful people in our community they recognize for great leadership. First was 
Cal and Joanne Bamford. Cal is a member of the Milgard School Advisory Board. Joanne is a member of my advisory board. They co-chair as a family our campaign. Their daughter Holly is involved in several things around campus. Their son Drew is involved in the Global Honors and the Institute of Global Engagement program. They're a fantastic family and they were given the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, by the Milgard School. So that was, let's give them a hand. They're, they're a great couple. And I'm not involved in the voting, so I don't understand how this exactly how this works, but the way I understand it is this year, it was so close that they gave two awards for nonprofit leadership, two wonderful, deserving people who are actually, we learned they're friends, uh, Maureen Fife and Helen McGovern Peelant uh, for the nonprofit leadership award. Uh, and then for the outstanding business person award, right there you see, I'm pointing down there, you see this. You see Bill Robertson, he's the CEO of MultiCare. I serve on the executive council with him. He has really hit Tacoma with a bang. He is doing all kinds of community service work. He's a great leader and we honored him as the outstanding business leader of the year. And then finally, small business leader of the year was Dale Maris. How many of you have been to Maris Farms? If you haven't been, you ought to go. We've been all three years since we lived here. They have a corn maze. They have a haunted house. We don't go to the haunted house, but we go to the corn maze. They have great food. It's, it's good family fun. So if you haven't been, and it's probably 20 minutes from campus, it's not far, so you should go. So that was very, very exciting. Whoops. I think I just jumped over. Yeah, I did. I jumped over my boss. So... Uh, Provost Baldesty, this amazes me. You know when he showed up at the UW? In September 1968. Go calculate that. That's 50 years this fall, and he's been there ever since except for one year, and he was at the UW, but he was at the University of Wisconsin for one year when he went to get his master's degree. But all of the rest of his life, he came from Spokane, Washington, to the University of Washington uh, in Seattle and has been there for almost 50 years. It's pretty amazing. Uh, after that night listening to the people who have worked with him longer than me. I've only had the privilege to work with him for three years. He is a very endeared person and has made great strides in keeping the focus on the students and the faculty and staff that teach those students at the University of Washington. Great leader. He'll be leaving us June 30th. And uh, Dr. Mark Richard from Berkeley has been named his successor. So it was a great event. And it was at this place called Harvest Vine. I'd never been there before. That was a pretty nice place, too. So you're shaking your head. You've been there before. It's nice. So I think this is about the, the last one. The fourth annual Deborah Friedman Lecture was last Thursday. It was an outstanding event. Uh, <clears throat> I went to welcome everybody. But the topic, I thought, was very related to what we do on this campus. Uh, it was uh, Carl Anthony, who is the author of this book, Earth, City, and the Hidden Narrative of Race. Uh, what it does is it ties together uh, our racial issues, our urban issues, along with poverty and race, and ties those also to our sustainability and environmental impact, uh, climate change, those kinds of things. So it was perfect for uh, really our campus and our audience. He did a dialogue for a while, had some students read from his book, and then he took questions. It was all in all a great night. Um, Dr. Fern Tiger was the moderator. She did an outstanding job of pulling from him uh, key areas around the book. Uh, and then we had an Africana uh, percussion group was the, inter not the entertainment, but the background music before and after it started. It was really an outstanding evening. And this was last week. So you can tell I'm getting to today, so I surely must be out of things. And I am. So that, that's kind of what's been happening. And again, I apologize if I left out something, but. The message there is there's always something cool going on at the University of Washington Tacoma. Okay, organizational leadership development. Again, this picture is purposeful. I was walking back from uh, the Y, I think, last Thursday before the weather got gray again, and I love the way our campus looks on beautiful days. So this was just last Thursday. So uh, for any of you who have just landed here this week, it does look like this occasionally. So. Um, some news, uh, a couple weeks ago, we announced that Dr. Jill Purdy would be the, the permanent executive vice chancellor for academic affairs. That's very exciting. Uh, and she actually starts tomorrow. So let's hear it for Jill.
We hope you're ready because that's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. She's been serving in that role for about 11 months, so she knows what tomorrow is going to be like. Uh, also, very exciting, I, I think I may have announced this. We were getting ready to close this. I couldn't announce the name at the last town hall because I was working on it. Now, now we not only have a name, but we have the person. Right over here, D James. Dr. James McShay. He is going to be starting on June 6th, but he's here with his family uh, to look for houses and look for schools and to hang out with us, I guess. Uh, he, he joined us on the benchmark trip in Atlanta. Great individual. He's going to be a wonderful asset to our campus, so we're excited to have him and his family. Uh, the last search going on in my office is underway. Uh, we're about to the point of advertising. We're trying to fine-tune the position description still, but that's the Indian Educator Tribal Liaison position. So that has been vacated. Uh, actually, Danica did fill in for a while as interim, uh, but needed to get back to her teaching. So that position is actually open right now, and we are eagerly trying to fill that. So the Educational Outreach Unit, I've talked about this several times, it actually launched formally on April 1st. Maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. The people who work in it noticed it launched. Uh, but one of those benchmarking trips was because of this to make sure as we launch it, we're thinking about the future and fine tuning it. What's going on right now is we're in the process of drafting an overall policy statement of how that will work. Uh, it's been vetted by the vice chancellors, it's been vetted by the other leadership team, by all the people that work in those units, uh, and now we're ready to take it to the deans and directors and to the faculty at large. And uh, the goal is to have a document that can be formally in place by July 1st. We're going to use it now, draft, because the organization has launched, uh, but we hope to have a document that all of us can be happy with by July 1st. Uh, also, I already talked about this, but I wanted to tell you things are going pretty well. You start seeing announcements uh, now from uh, Dr. Becker's office about um, uh, IR things, uh, the, the fall and the spring uh, census count, all those kinds of things. That's going well. Uh, last time I announced that three of our four research centers had been reviewed. Now they've all four been reviewed. We got the fourth one done. So that process that Dr. Uh, the Tehran started last June or so, has now been through its first round of reviews. And then I wanted to mention one more time, because I hear reference to it, uh, I've heard reference to it several times, including when Jill and I accepted the, uh, uh, the Golden Shovel Award, is the Center for Women's R Leadership that was founded last summer has been renamed the Dressel Scholars Program, and that's embedded inside a center we already have. Dr. Joe Lawless, uh, who operates the Center for Leadership and Social Responsibility, that Dressel Scholars Program is inside that center. Did I give him a title that he doesn't have? Okay. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Lawless, I have to take that back. <laughs> Mr. Joe Lawless, yeah. Okay, campaign update. Anybody want to guess? 38. A little high. 36, a little high still. 27, ah, too low. 35, not quite. 33 is closer. 31, 8, 4, 3. And we're probably 32 by now. This is three or four days old. So that's over 70%. So uh, that's good news. We are a little more than 70% into the timeline, but we know that we have several things that are right out there getting ready to be uh, added to this total, and we're working hard. We're poised to, to finish this campaign off successfully. Uh, along with that, you can kind of look at the breakdown. You can see the areas. If they're bigger down here, this is the remaining goal. This is the secured portion of those areas. So you can see in student support, we have a little larger goal left over than we've secured so far. In terms of program support for our faculty and students, this is more programming, we are well into that goal. Okay? So uh, we update this all the time and talk to our volunteers about it. It's all going to come out fantastic in the end. It is going fantastic right now. Okay, this I wanted to talk a little bit about. So uh, what happened with the legislature, you all know because you read in the papers, but let's talk about it. That compensation, the, the funding split, uh, we were happy that they did fund it, but they funded it 
temporary. Okay, remember, uh, all the other four-year schools got funded 50-50. Tuition pays for 50 of it. The other 50, you got to pay yourself. For the UW, they gave us a third and asked us to pay two-thirds ourselves. We were upset about that. We did a full court press trying to get them to understand how impactful that was to the UW. It's about a $10 million deficit to the university as a whole, about $1 million for our campus. Uh, and they did fund it, but for one year, and said they were going to study and see what other states, what's best practices, and they'll come forward with a plan somewhere between a third and a half this year. So we're all hoping for the half. Or maybe they'll decide more than half. That would be nice, but I doubt it. So that's only temporary. So it, that, that's problematic because we can't give money away that's temporarily uh, in, a, in a continuing salary. Okay, the legal pathways, this was really exciting. Uh, we did a, uh, what was it called, a Hail Mary. It actually didn't make it through the budget the first time through. They submitted a, uh, uh, what do you call it when you change the budget? Um, amendment, there you go, amendment to the budget, uh, which at first didn't pass either, but uh, on a second try, the amendment passed. It was our Pierce County legislators that really went to bat for us and got that back into the budget and through the compromise budget at the end. So we're working on that right now, uh, looking to hire somebody permanently. Uh, the Federal Way Center, and I, I have several numbers here. Uh, we worked with Federal Way and Highline School and the Federal Way School District and put together a proposal for $800,000 to get that center off the ground. During deliberations, uh, one of the local uh, Federal Way legislative uh, individuals thought that it wasn't going to pass and, and to help it pass, reduced it, did an amendment for 500,000 uh, and it passed at 500,000. We believe, us and Highline, that that's a little bit thin to get it off the ground. We want to get it off the ground uh, in a robust way with a full, uh, full UW and Highline support and rigor. So uh, myself and Jeff Waggetts, the interim president of Highline, visited with uh, the Federal Way, Way Mayor about two weeks ago, and he's committed to helping us uh, get an extra $100,000 so that we can start that next fall with $600,000. So that's why there's three lines through that. Uh, also, this didn't come without a lot of work. If you haven't said thank you to Michael Work in a while, as you leave here today, he's standing right there, say thank you to Michael Work. He is totally diligent. He works so hard in bringing the right people uh, together at the right time to talk to these legislators uh, and we don't take no for an answer we keep going back to them uh, asking them for things and that's what actually caused this to happen was uh, Mike's work Mike works work and a lot of others we had support from uh, Seattle and from our, our staff that work in Olympia uh, the capital budget was released back in January. You know about that, but I want to tell you the building uh, pre-design work is in full swing, and you had an opportunity to go visit with that uh, last week. Maybe this no, it was last week, right? You had an opportunity for that, and we did get some soil remediation money, as we've asked for before. Okay, for next year, well, I, I just assume, and I can just bet you, that the number one ask for the UW in whole will be that tuition fund split. Since they only funded it part-time, we'll be doing the full court press again, trying to get them to understand the impact that that has, and we'll be asking for that funding. Uh, on this campus, we've put forward a request to fund our additional disciplines that we need in engineering to fill out the full portfolio that's been uh, on the plate for five or six years, and that's mechanical engineering, staged by the following year, civil engineering. So it starts out with a, a few faculty, a few support uh, folks in um, sciences, library, and then the second year, filling that out more and starting civil engineering, and what's not shown here, but the, the third year and fourth year, we'd fill that out, and after, I believe, four years, it would be completely funded and we'd be on our way. Okay, that's new money, uh, which is different than trying to do it the way we had the, the past couple programs, the electrical engineering, and the biomedical sciences were done out of tuition only, which is extremely difficult and get us to too tight uh, internally, financially. Okay, another thing that came towards us, uh, it actually came towards us last year, 
uh, some past legislators uh, and a current uh, well-positioned legis legislature had an idea for a uh, statewide educational strategy center. Since we don't have a comprehensive organization that looks at strategy across K-12, two-year, and four-year, since that's been done away with, they thought that would be very positive, and they thought it should go at our institution. Uh, we have an outstanding education school uh, with a doctoral program. We are located close to Olympia, so they thought it should come here. Uh, now, with the priorities last year, we couldn't take that on. So uh, this year, we've decided that we will take that on on their behalf. Uh, our top priority will still be our things, but we're more than, than happy to work with them on that. So that's going on. Uh, we will ask for capital money for a building to put our new disciplines in, uh, also expansion of the Milgard School, general purpose classroom, some event space, all kinds of things in our next academic building, uh, and that's what the pre-design money was for. So now we gotta ask for the, the real money to build it, uh, and then we'll ask for soil remediation money again. We usually start out with two, they might fund one, they might fund two, uh, and then again, I gotta let you know now, because we might come to you and ask for your support, it's gonna take uh, a village to get this done. We've submitted it to Seattle, and now our job is to get Seattle to prioritize it, and then once Seattle prioritizes it, then we need to get with our legislative and community folks to, to get these things past the finish line. Okay, our financial picture, and our, uh, our chief finance guy's in the front row, so I hope I don't get in trouble with this. But let me explain what I'm trying to, to capture here. Uh, what I showed you the last couple town halls were these two lines. The red line and the purple dotted line, or maybe blue dotted line. And what that showed you, remember, is that in the middle of this legislative session, like the 19 year, we were going to have this crossover point. So what we were concentrating on was trying to push that into the future. It was getting very close, within $300,000 of crossing over because our expenses are outpacing our income. So what we've done is we've started resetting the budget. We are taking other sources of income and feeding those into the actual budget that we use on a continuing basis. Example of that is some of the administrative units, such as finance administration, my office, Dr. Purdy's office. Uh, we have summer money. We're putting that summer money into the pot for the whole campus and redistributing it in areas where we have ongoing need and we're sure there's gonna be expenses there. So what that does for my office is reduces flexibility uh, quite a bit. So you can't be coming to me asking for things because I won't have it. But what it does for the campus is these monies that we know will be there each year will be directed towards expenses that we know will be there each year. So we're doing that. We're also doing that with some auxiliary uh, budget money. We're also working to uh, make our auxiliary enterprise efficient and robust. We're adding a uh, enterprise car rental place. Uh, we're also supporting our research enterprise, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So what I hope to do is to be able to supplement the red line with green stuff and keep our expenses, no, our income significantly above expenses going forward so that we can have some flexibility and we can take that difference and invest it in campus-wide things we need to do. And our students want things done here. They would like a student, so they want lots of things here, and we want to give students things that are going to help them be successful. So that's the goal. So what does this mean for us? It means we'll stick on to charting our course. That's a very important document for us, and it's going to be critical in helping us make our decisions uh, with the resources we have going forward. The growth agenda will be carefully managed, and I'm really glad that now we'll have an academic plan that's been uh, reviewed and done actually by our faculty to help us with the prioritization of where we put new faculty positions or uh, adding or redoing faculty positions where there's retirements or resignations. So that will all be important. Uh, I will still ask that we may make sure that we don't violate the agreed upon um, or the historical ratios of types of faculty we have on campus. We don't want to do this all on the back of temporary people. We want to do it uh, with 
a fair mixture of tenure track and competitively hired, non-competitively hired lectures. And just like the engineering programs, we will need to ask for outside resources to do significant new programs. The money just can't come out of tuition. There's not enough there. And our EBC and CBC, those are the two budget groups, uh, are going to really work hard this summer to try to put together a budget um, process for this campus for the coming year where everybody can feel engaged and participate and feel like you made a difference in how the budget process was implemented for the next uh, legislative session, the next biennium. So we're going to work hard. We've tried a couple different things. We've tried transparency. We've tried clarity. And now we want to try transparency and, clar and clarity with additional engagement. And I will still continue to make a nuisance of myself with the things that I believe can bring additional income because that's very important to keep that little green line above the red line. And we can't do it. We've already demonstrated we can't do it if we don't bring new income to the table. Okay, I'm running out of time here. But uh, the important thing to say about this is that we can return, since we've demonstrated to the provost and the president that we can be financially sustainable over the long haul, we can return to our role that we all like to have as being that growth agenda for the South Sound. Our community depends on that, and we believe fully that we can return to that now and in a logical and deliberate way grow along with our community and serve the needs of the students in the South Sound. Okay, campus growth, just one quick slide. Uh, last fall, we hit 5185. You all remember that? which was a 4% growth. Uh, we held, look how much we held at the winter quarter. That's unbelievable. Most schools aren't able to hold that, but we did. We dropped a little bit this quarter, but we're planning on 5,400 for next fall. So based on that sustainable financial plan that we presented to uh, Seattle, uh, they're agreeing to let us grow by 4% this coming fall. Uh, the breakdown, I assume we're planning on very similar to what it was last fall about 16% graduate students, 84% undergraduate students, very similar uh, breakdown. And I would suspect that the characteristics of the class this coming fall will be similar. We'll see. Maybe we can continue to get a little more diverse. One thing I am going to ask that we look at is, look at this right here, 92.6% Washington. We brag about that. That's very, very good. We're able to say, we educate people here in the South Sound, and they go right back to work in the South Sound. But I think we have a little bit of room there, maybe down to 90%, and we're still doing that in a big way, uh, to increase the diversity of our campus with respect to out-of-staters and to international students. Why couldn't we increase our out-of-state by 3 or 4%? Likewise, our international population may be up to 6% or something like that. That gives us a lot of breathing room financially if we can get out of state and international students. Okay, charting our port course progress. Lightning talks continued. They were well attended uh, in the fall, I mean, not in the fall, in the winter quarter. We did culture and students. The strategic initiative funds, uh, we're looking at a possible 2.0 for this sometime this fall. We're also looking at, at asking the SPCC and our assistant chancellor for strategy and assessment to uh, recommend some uh, uses for those strategic funds uh, that we've had set aside. Uh, some of the strategic funding requests that were approved last year have been very successful. Uh, the creative engagement workshops, how many of you went to, to those? Yes, I see uh, maybe a third of the room. They were outstanding. They were four weeks long, four hours each for the entire month of April. They were well attended, very enriching. Uh, also, the Office of Student Advocacy, I'm going to talk about that in a second, has been very successful. The peer language classes, we've offered two of those already. The Arch Bridging Program is going to be in a week. And uh, Bonnie tells us that there will be a report on all these things to you in July, so you can read all the details about this. Um, the strategy, a Strategic Initiative Fund, I think I got ahead of myself. We're going to do a second round of requests. I already said this, but it was in this slide. Uh, in the fall, uh, the Equity Data Working Group 
is getting near its recommendation. They have almost 100 responses to the equity data uh, working group. We're going to uh, ask the new assistant chancellor, since he's here in person now, to, to help us with that. And then we're going to launch a dashboard, uh, hopefully by next fall, so we can begin to measure our progress in the strategic plan. And if some of you are interested, we're going to have another call for a couple of our impact goal champions. Research progress. Oh, you might want to look at that picture again. That was two weeks ago. Beautiful day on our campus. I'm not sure who that is, but who's busy. <laughs> okay, for the past four years, we've been doing really well. We have about 40 uh, research grants uh, a year on our campus. You see we had 43 and 15, and it's uh, kind of hung out there around 40. This year, we're already at 38, and we have a couple months to go. So the research enterprise is going up. The, the cool thing is the volume of, or, or the amount of money that we've pulled in ha has a sharp increase this year. So those 38 grants represent twice as much as the 39 we've had in the previous couple of years. So the size of our grants is getting larger. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, how has this happened? Well, it's happened because of our fantastic faculty. Uh, Kai young Ri, who's in the back of the room there, she is our chair elect for our faculty assembly. She's got a wonderful grant this year, along with some uh, co-PIs. I'm just mentioning the PI. A uh, million dollars over three years. Likewise, Erica Klein has a large grant, $650,000 over five years, with several of her fellow faculty members involved with that grant. Uh, likewise, Joel Baker out at the, uh, at the Urban Waters uh, partnered with several people from the Puget Sound Institute, $4.2 million from the Environmental Protection Agency. We thought that was going to be closed down. Some of us did. Uh, so that's wonderful news. Uh, and then Dr. Belinda Louie, $2.7 million over four years. Very significant grant from the Department of Education. So our faculty researchers, there's many more, but these are four of those 38 grants. So uh, I think we should give our faculty a hand for the wonderful work. And then our friends in SAES. I'm having a mental block. I know what that is. Student and Enrollment Services. Uh, and you all know where that is. Whoops. You all know where that is up by the science building. Does anybody know what those are? All right. Some significant things going on in Student Enrollment Services. The Emergency Aid Lab. This is a national, international uh, activity that we are one of five schools. Remember, they've presented on this before. It's going well. What we do, these five schools, will become the best practices. We'll look at each of the five schools and put it together. This will be the best practices that will be used across the country for emergency aid. In the current academic year, they've received 60 requests. These are things that are showstoppers, keeping a student from progressing and graduating. 36 of those have been approved and 30 have gone with wraparound services. It's being very effective. Uh, and down here, if you look at the donors, um, not quite, but our don uh, donations this year have just about taken care of the request. And we can't sustain that over time. We need a couple large philanthropic gifts to sustain this over time. But uh, people stepped up and really made a big difference this year. Uh, also, one of the people that made a big difference was Key Bank. Key Bank was who uh, funded our Professional Development Center, Key Bank Professional Development Center, for five years. Uh, that's launched on its own now to educational outreach, and now they're back and they've launched another activity, the Opportunity Academy. $300,000 gift over six year, five years, uh, and several things are gonna go on there. It will be uh, to establish a, a, a person in the Career Services Office that will help us with internships. Right now we're developing the position description. Okay, the, student, uh, the Office of Student Advocacy and Support was open due to strategic impact funding or strategic initiative funding. That's uh, going very well. 26 unique cases were heard in the, in the spring, or in the winter quarter, rather, and eight new community referrals were done as a result of that. Uh, also, uh, SAES has really taken on uh, the professional development workshops in their area. They've had all kinds of workshops that... Uh, Mintha has brought to campus green dot bystander training, undocu ally training, safe talk, eliminating barriers, 
All kinds of workshops are being added to campus and training to help us do our jobs better. And Court 17's held 72 programs, including eight by our own faculty. Husky 100, we have 11 students this year. We had been consistent at eight and eight the first two years. This year, we have 11. So we have more than our fair share. That ceremony is gonna come, I think, on May 7th. Or May, yeah, May 7th. Uh, Med Admitted Students Day was uh, highly successful this year. 269 prospective students and more, more than that of their family members were here on campus. Uh, and then stay tuned for Oct uh, Oscars next Friday night. Not this Friday, but a week from Friday. Whew, I made it. <laughs> so that's what you get for not asking questions in the past. You get a little bit longer, but I do have time for just a couple questions this week. I just want to... Hi. I just want to let everybody know, uh, I'm Joel Larson from the Institute of Technology. Uh, I have the posters from the uh, open houses from the academic building in my office. So if you missed that and you wanted to come see um, what they, where we're at so far with that process, um, my office is just over here behind the men's room in CP 133. <laughs> it's a central landmark. Uh, if you want to come see them, I have those. Thank you, Joel. Other question or comment? I just wanted to add on the emergency aid funding, in addition to what was given this year in the campaign, there was a, a, about a half a million dollar endowment that had been created to fund emergency aid as well. And we would hope for additional endowment donors to step up and see this is an important part of the student support portfolio. So. Thank you, Josh. Well, will you please fill out uh, your card? I don't, I can't keep up talking for 50 minutes. I used to be able to when I was uh, a professor, but I found that was pretty difficult to keep that pace going. So I would like uh, to interact with you more in the town hall. So if there's something you can do uh, or something you can su suggest uh, to make this more user-friendly to what you need. You know, I get to meet with the leadership team, the vice chancellors and then the larger leadership team on Mondays, every Monday, and we can talk about things, but I don't get to meet with all the rest of you. So some way that we could do that would be very useful to me. Yes. Okay, so the question was, last time I was hobbling around with my cane, I got rid of the cane two weeks ago. I got a second opinion. I went to an orthopedic surgeon. He said, uh, he had looked at my x-rays. He said, would you stand on your right leg? So I stood, that's my bad leg, stood on. He said, now will you hop? I said, are you sure? And he said, yes, hop. So he wanted me to hop around his office. He thought I would do better walking on it. So I've been walking on it for two weeks. Today at five, I have uh, my third x-ray and an appointment with my other doctor who had me on the cane. Uh, for a longer period of time tomorrow. So hopefully she'll see that walking on it has helped and I don't have to have a cane. I can't run though for a couple more months. And I can feel it. Days that I walk most, I can feel right where the break was, but hopefully it's getting better. Thank you for asking about that. Anything else? Well, you've been very patient. Thank you for sitting there quietly and watching all those slides. I feel like I've told you everything I know. So hopefully you can use that for some good. Thank you.